Well, welcome. I'm glad that you're all here this evening because I think we're really in for a treat this evening. Thank you for joining us virtually. Please feel free to stand up and stretch because one of the things we've been doing as uh, this past year and a half is spending a lot of time in front of the screen. So we need to make ourselves comfortable. These lectures are co-sponsored by the Crook County Historical Society and the Friends of the Crook County Library. My name is Carrie Gordon and I'm with the Friends of the Crook County Library. We welcome your membership and volunteer time and the summer reading program is possible, possible because of the Friends support. Check out the upcoming youth and adult programs being offered this summer at the library. This evening, we are pleased to bring Peter Marbach, Healing the Big River. The Columbia Headwaters inspired Peter's 10-year critically acclaimed photography project, From Source to Sea. He drove 14 hours to the Columbia's Headwaters, a small spring bubbling out of the ground in the Rocky Mountains of British Columbia. And having been up in that area, it is gorgeous. This is, I'm really looking forward to his photo essay because he traveled the 1,243 mile length of the Columbia River and it's collected in his book, Healing the Big River, Salmon Dreams and the Columbia River Treaty. And he has offered to help out the museum this evening. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book, then we will have that information at the tail end of our presentation. Peter has been a professional photographer for 25 years. He's published six photo essay books and had previous assignment work with numerous conservation groups, the Forest Service and outdoor travel editorial work. In October, 2014, Peter was featured on an episode of Oregon Field Guide. His current professional focus is as a visual storyteller using his photography to address important environmental and indigenous justice issues. Please feel free to put any questions you might have into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of this presentation, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions of Peter. And he has a guest with him, Graham Rollins from British Columbia. So you'll get an opportunity to talk to both of them. Please welcome Peter. And Peter is a little, little, uh, hidden this evening, so we will pop right into his screen share of his PowerPoint, but you should hear his voice really well. Peter, welcome. Thank you so much. So much everyone for, for, for tuning in tonight. Um, it's really wonderful to be able to do, to be at this place now. Um, we're at the, hopefully the, the fading days of, of COVID. We were all locked in the, this, this, this winter and um, it's been really great to get outside and see so many people back in the outdoors. So I hope you're all being able to get out there and do that too. Um, Carrie, thank you so much for the introduction and, and, and Graham, thank you so much for, for joining in tonight. Uh, folks, uh, Graham is gonna be available at, at the end of my talk to answer any questions you might have um, about the current status of the Columbia River Treaty and his uh, unique uh, perspective on things, um, living in British Columbia and being very aware of the process uh, up there. So this first image you're, you're seeing tonight, you might be wondering if anyone has climbed this peak before. This is the summit of Mount Hood. Oh boy, how do I tell this story very shortly? Um, 19 years ago, I underwent uh, unexpected triple bypass open heart surgery. Um, eight months later, I stood on the summit of Mount Hood and I knew I was healed and whole again. Because that's per se my office, being outdoors, climbing mountains, all that, but during the healing process, I spent a lot of time along the shores of the Columbia River, hiking the trails. And then this little ribbon of water that you can see from the summit of Mount Hood, that's the Columbia River. So when I was able to climb Mount Hood again, I stood there and I made a promise out loud that someday I would do something to thank the Columbia River for bringing me back and for healing. It just took a very long time to be able to pull it all together to find just the right, um, um, avenue for storytelling. And it was the Columbia River Treaty that really brought it all together. So this is, uh, again, this is sunrise from the summit of Mount Hood. Yeah, that's, that's working, good. that's totally no, fine. fine. We see it very well, Peter. 
Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, folks, so this, so this is a map that shows you um, the entire uh, Columbia River from its start, from its headwaters in the tiny town of Canal Flats, and it flows north for nearly 200 miles up until it makes a big bend and comes all the way down across Washington and travels over 1,200 miles um, to the ocean. Uh, very few people realize just how much of the river is in British Columbia. And having been up there numerous times in the last 15 years or so, it is by far the most scenic um, part of the whole, the whole journey. Okay. So this is where the river actually begins. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see a body of water. That's Lake uh, Columbia. And the river drains out of that. And you can see how wild and free it is. It just literally may be 15 yards across. And it does this undulating forever S-curves, S winding up between the Rocky Mountains uh, to the east and the Purcell Mountains to the west. It's just unbelievably beautiful. And so I was told a long time ago by the uh, writer uh, Robin Cody, who was one of the first people to kayak uh, or canoe the whole river way back in 1994. I think it was called Voyage of a Summer Sun. And he told me way back in 2007, he says, Peter, there's a spot up there where you can straddle the Columbia. And that just blew my mind that you could actually do that. And so I was obsessed with trying to find this spot. So it took many, many tries, but this image you see is me straddling where the water bubbles up uh, out of the ground. Now, it doesn't look like it's that difficult an image, but uh, trust me, it was really brutally awful weather for three days. And I had to put the camera on the tripod and I would run and jump in, take a picture, come back and look at it and say, oh, that's a piece of crap. Do it again, do it again. So I was just trying to capture that, that moment, that feeling of what it's like to stand right at the headwaters. Sorry, folks, this is going a little slow. So this is uh, Alfred uh, Joseph. He is a um, leader of the, uh, one of the leaders of the Tunaha Nation. And I had the opportunity to meet him uh, several years ago while working on, on this uh, project. And I sat down with him and he was telling me the, the story of how way back in the early 1940s, how his grandfather would go down to the river near the headwaters and greet the return of the salmon. And weeks went by, a couple of months went by, and his grandfather didn't understand. He thought that perhaps they had done something as a tribe to, uh, to upset the creator that the fish wouldn't return. And he had no idea of knowing that it was around that time that the Grand Coulee Dam had been completed enough to block the passage of the salmon. And this has been over 80 years ago, folks. And so for 80 years, people living upstream of the Columbia, not just tribal people, but all people have been waiting for the salmon to come home. But in particular, uh, the tribes and, and First Nations, because it's not just spirituality, it's, it's their culture, it's the economy. There's so many things tied into getting the fish back up above, above the Grand Coulee Dam. So it was a really poignant moment talking with him because there was like a single tear in his eye and I was trying to keep my, myself together um, listening to him, but it was just one of the many, many stories of the really beautiful people I met along the way. So this is an aerial uh, photograph. I got over my fear of going up in little two-seater planes and I was afraid I was gonna barf my brains out, but uh, I got this really cool image of you can see just how wild and free the wetlands are of the Columbia River between the two mountain ranges. And I think I have this information uh, right. Uh, uh, Graham, you can correct me a little later if I'm, if I'm wrong, but the wetlands area is one of the, I think it's the second largest intact uh, wetlands ecosystem in all of North America. And they have an annual festival up there called the Wings Over the Rockies Festival that celebrates the, um, uh, this area being the flyway for um, bird populations um, going up and down the West Coast. But it is just absolutely stunning. I mean, the images really don't do it justice, but at least it'll give you uh, a hint of what this is like. And so even though salmon uh, no longer return uh, to the headwaters, uh, the First Nations, various First Nations in the area still continue to have a, they celebrate uh, with a salmon festival in September. And, but uh, ironically, they have to have fish um, flown in or trucked in from uh, other places in Canada so they can hold um, the ceremony. So we're moving up, up river now and I was uh, uh, driving north and I saw this beautiful light happening on the mountains but I couldn't figure out how to get from where I was driving and a set of railroad tracks and 12 foot tall blackberry brambles to get down to this shot to the river. So I just pushed my way through the blackberry uh, brambles ruined my clothes, but you can see why it was worth it. I mean, just this tremendous calm 
uh, section that shows you um, the mountain range and very different from the experience that most uh, Oregonians and Washingtonians have of the Columbia River and the Columbia River Gorge as this big giant series of lakes. It is just wild and free up there beyond your imagination. And so this was a, another uh, aerial um, uh, shot. I wanted to kind of give the overview of the drainage from the Columbia ice fields and the mountains and just the absolute um, sublime serenity and peace and all the water that drains from the mountains into the river. This is the Bush River, which is uh, flowing down from the Columbia ice fields. Um, many people think that the Columbia ice fields is a source of the river and that's been uh, put out there many years ago, but that is not correct. It's uh, from a underground spring from the nearby Kootenai River that bubbles up from the ground, uh, literally quite near where I was standing in that uh, winter shot before. But this just shows you the terrain, just how different it is uh, from, from down here. So we're moving uh, down, down river now, we're, we're, we're um, um, in the States. And what this is, this is a canoe brigade um, sponsored by the Upper Columbia United Tribes. And there, there's five member tribes from Washington and, and Idaho and the uh, teenagers and youth uh, fr from the tribes uh, take a special six month course learning how to carve out and build their own canoes. And as their reward, they get to travel down from near the border all the way down to the, the uh, ancient uh, site of, of Kettle Falls where, where they put in and every year they have a ceremony around the, the summer solstice. And uh, Kettle Falls was very similar to Salilo Falls uh, on the Columbia River near the Dalles as, as a hub for, for, for trading and tribes have come all over. It was, it was a, a prominent uh, fishing site, but also just a gathering place, a social place. And all that what went away when, when the dams went, uh, went in. So at this particular event, you can see these little black dots in the sky. These are stones being thrown back into the river because what the, they would say was that this is the sound uh, that the salmon would hear as they would come upstream, coming up uh, along the the gravel bed. And just before they tossed the stones, they, they were knocking them together to, to mimic the sound that the salmon would hear. It was quite a beautiful, uh, lovely uh, ceremony that I was honored to be invited to and, and watch. And so here is the big uh, behemoth, the, the beast. From here, it looks rather benign, but it's, it's close to 600 foot tall, the Grand Coulee Dam. And this is really quite literally like ground zero. It's like halfway up the Columbia River almost perfectly. But this is where everything stopped. Uh, the United States and Canada had the opportunity when this dam was being built to install fish ladders. But um, to make a very long story short, it, it came down to cost. And the United States um, basically asked the Canadian government if they didn't mind, if they didn't uh, spend the money to install fish ladders in the uh, um, it, it was allowed. So that, that's the, the beginning of the end uh, up until now um, of, the, of, of the salmon runs. And I've heard some very sad and poignant stories of tribal people going down to the Grand Coulee Dam and seeing the, the salmon die. They were throwing themselves against the wall, hur hurling themselves, trying to get over. So it was a very um, disturbing moment uh, in our history. And hopefully someday that this wrong uh, can be righted. This is right near the base of Grand Coulee Dam. This is a uh, Randy Friedlander, a member of the Colville tribe and directory, a director of the fisheries program there. Uh, every year, Randy has this um, ceremony that he does when he catches the first salmon uh, of the year coming up river below Chief Joseph Dam. He, he catches them and uh, cleans them. And then he goes to the base of the Grand Coulee Dam and tosses their remains in the river. And he says a prayer out loud that loosely translated um, uh, thanks the creator for, for salmon, but also apologizes uh, uh, to the salmon for what has happened to the river. But the prayer uh, sort of goes like this by tossing the remains uh, in the river that their spiritual DNA will be there and be present when the salmon do return so they will know the way, which way to go that their ancestors were here. So again, just a, a, a tremendous pr privilege to be uh, witnessing something like this. So this is one of the um, promising uh, technologies to help with advancing the return of the salmon above the dams. Uh, this is a very long uh, tube. It was a, a, a creation 
invented by Woosh Innovations. And some of you may have heard of this if you just Google the phrase salmon cannon. I know it sounds silly, but it's essentially what it does is if you look down at the bottom of the image, there is a floating uh, fish uh, collection station and the fish come in and they basically, they transport them uh, by this pneumatic pressure and the fish do not get hurt. There's a 95% survival rate. And they have successfully demonstrated that they can uh, shoot uh, the fish through these tubes uh, at, at a very minimum of 250 feet or more. And that's the height of the Chief uh, Joseph Dam, which is the one dam just below Grand Coulee, which also would have to be retrofitted with, with fish ladders to be able to get the fish back up and over. So it's just one of many, many options that are out there that are very promising. I mean, it, it looks, you know, some people look at it and they think it's funny, but it actually does work. I've seen demonstrations and it's, it's a matter of um, uh, inertia now with uh, Army Corps of Engineers and other, other people who are uh, somewhat skeptical that this uh, technology can work. So of course, if I'm doing a book or a project and trying to tell stories about salmon, I have to get at least one image of a salmon, right? So I was told by members of the Okanagan Nation Alliance uh, fisheries people that they said, you know, we have this tremendous salmon run that comes up the Okanagan River, some 900 miles from the ocean. And if you come up in the middle of October, you can stand in the water and there'll be hundreds of fish and you'll get great images. Well, I went there for three days, knelt in the water and the fish would come within maybe 20 yards of me. And then they would go way to the left and way to the right. And I was saying, come on, you guys, I've come all the way up here to try to help you folks. And so on my last day there, the last hour before I was ready to give up, this one fish comes over and just sits there for like a minute. And then he took off. It was, it was like the creator was saying, hey guys, he's trying to help you give him a break. So anyway, it was, it was, uh, you know, typical for this project. There's the plan and then there's, then there's what happens. So now we're uh, en entering down uh, near where the Columbia River forms the border of Oregon and, and Washington. Uh, this is near a place called the Wallula Gap on the Columbia River. And the, what you see in the center there are these twin pillars called the Cayuse Sisters. Uh, originally, I was trying to photograph these pillars from the road and I decided to, to hike up there because I saw an old uh, um, animal path or deer path. And I got up near the pillars and I thought, oh, there, it might be really cool to get way up high. So I went another 800 feet or so and was able to get this really nice uh, image uh, at, at, at first light of the twin uh, uh, pillars looking down the Columbia. So this was a lo lovely day too. I was invited by Jeremy uh, Red Star Wolf uh, to spend a few hours on the Umatilla River uh, with his son, uh, Aiden. Uh, Jeremy is a uh, high up member of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission and a, a leader of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla. And here he is teaching his son the 10,000 year old tradition of dip net fishing uh, on the uh, Umatilla River. And it was a really beautiful day. I got to spend, like I said, about a half a day with him and his daughter, and although they only caught one fish, just seeing the beauty of him teaching him this 10,000 year old uh, tradition, it was quite an honor to be uh, invited. So a little over a decade ago, maybe even longer, um, bighorn sheep were reintroduced uh, toward the Eastern end of the Columbia River Gorge. Um, and if you've ever been to the gorge and seen some of the famous uh, petroglyphs and rock art there, you often see images of bighorn sheep. So it was pretty cool to be able to witness this live. Uh, I spent the day just sort of rambling around and I saw these guys way up on the hill and I did the old fashioned belly crawl with my lens being hit hiding behind a rock and they came down and they took forever. I said, come on, you guys do the headbutt thing. I got to get the headbutt thing. So I finally did it and it's pretty comical because they do smash their heads and then they kind of walk away staggered as if they're dizzy, like watching a cartoon. So just downriver from there, this is the site of Celilo Falls. Uh, this particular image was taken in 2007 to commemorate the 50 year remembrance of the loss of Celilo Falls. It was in March of 1957 when Celilo Falls was drowned. And uh, at, at this particular ceremony, tribes came from all over. They came from uh, the Pacific Ocean, from, from way up near Canada, and they all landed at Celilo Falls. And it was a very beautiful, poignant, moving ceremony. I mean, the, the media called it anniversary or celebration and, and the tribal people were saying, no, not really. This is more of a, a remembrance than a, than, a, than a sad day, but honoring what the falls used to mean to them. 
And just down the <clears throat> river from there, uh, this is the uh, Klickitat River. And again, this is another um, image of um, a really ancient tradition. This is a, a gentleman doing um, on a, standing on a platform <clears throat> doing traditional dip net um, fishing. And I had to time this just right because he's moving it back and forth. And there's a moment where he stops just for a second. So that's why the, the, the water, I can get a, a blurry shot, but he stopped uh, just, for, just for a second. But it's very mesmerizing to stand there and watch these people do it like for hours upon hours. This was a really wonderful day too. This is uh, Annalise McConnell, uh, the daughter of, of Bridget uh, McConville, who is also one of the guest essayists uh, in my book. I was invited to spend a morning with them out on the Warm Springs uh, Reservation where they were doing the traditional first roots um, harvest. And this was taken you know, a long time ago. And this is a young woman who's now, I think been, been through college and in her mid twenties, but she was, I think in her teenage years when I first met them. But again, just being welcomed by um, tribal folks and being able to get a, a unique uh, inside view that most people don't get was very rewarding. This is from up near the summit of a uh, Dog Mountain. We're moving down through the Columbia River Gorge now, and this is the river looking east uh, toward Portland. Um, Dog Mountain, I was just up there two days ago, is normally one of the premier wildflower uh, places in the gorge, but I often go up there when there's bad weather predicted because there's usually a moment where the sun will break through and you get something dramatic. So it was worth getting hammered with hail and sleet and freezing rain, and then popping out just for a second to get this really cool uh, image. So this is the uh, lower uh, Lewis River uh, Falls on the Lewis River. Uh, we're down now past Portland, working our way up uh, toward uh, the Astoria uh, area. This was once a very prominent uh, fishing site for, for the Cowlitz tribe, but a, a dam went in um, on this river and that, and that also uh, stopped uh, their ability to harvest uh, salmon. But it's a pretty beautiful, amazing spot. And to think that salmon used to jump up and over these, these falls is pretty pretty crazy. So now we're nearing uh, the, the confluence, we're actually right at the confluence of the Columbia River and the Pacific Ocean. This is from Cape Disappointment uh, State Park. Um, forecast had called for a whole bunch of things. There was a full moon, king tide, high tide, thunder and lightning. And I thought, okay, there's gonna be something really cool happening there. So I went down there and, and quite literally laid on the ground for about six hours until it parted just enough and the image I had was in my mind was more of like a curling wave doing this really cool thing. But the wind was so ferocious, it was blowing the water up and keeping it up in the air and swirling it around. So it was really a, just a phenomenal moment to be able to, to witness this. But this is the, the fury you know, of where the river meets the ocean. But then when the storm is all over, this is where the Columbia meets the Pacific. So to, to be able to go from the very beginning to straddle the headwaters to its three mile wide, uh, confluence is, is quite quite an amazing moment. Um, the last image I'm going to show you was is something that's very was very special too. This was I think it was in August of 2019. Um, the Colville tribes and other tribes uh, up above Grand Coulee Dam, um, they're uh, permitted to do what's called a, a cultural release of salmon and there were about 30 salmon that were released above the Grand Coulee Dam and it's an ongoing um, project, which I can talk about later, that they're going to, they're um, monitoring and seeing uh, if the salmon that are released are, are being able to get up upriver and find habitat and food and all that stuff. But this was a very emotional day because people came down to the river and they were just crying and hollering. It was very exciting because for some of these people who remember the closing of the Grand Coulee Dam, this is the first time they've seen salmon put back into the river. And it was a very exciting moment because I was standing there in the water uh, trying to be respectful and keep my distance, but one of the salmon brushed up against my legs. And I have to tell you that the, the hair just went up in the back of my neck and I turned around and I could see him, his tail just going back and forth, uh, heading off uh, uh, up river. So it was a very hopeful, uh, poignant moment. Um, the book that was mentioned earlier is filled with tremendous essays by 10 uh, guest authors and, and writers, and uh, uh, Graham, who you'll hear from later, was one of the um, uh, guest essayists, and he was actually the first person to submit his, his essay. I, I met him on the Columbia River. I think somehow he found out about my project, and he was bicycling the entire Columbia River, and it was pretty amazing. We met him in Hood River, and we, we stayed in touch, and um, he, his voice represents the, 
the youthful uh, generation, people from all ages, from their mid 20s up until their mid 70s have contributed essays. And I'm just gonna read briefly an, ex an excerpt from, from Graham's uh, contribution. My generation will be some of the last people to know glaciers on the mountain peaks. We will be some of the last to love many oceanside places. Some of the last to remember summers not consumed by wildfire and choked by smoke. Some of the first to get used to the term climate refugee. My generation will be one of the last to have lived in a time before this loss became to some degree inevitable. The value of salmon restoration goes far beyond the number of fish that are eventually able to return. It goes far beyond the quantity of nutrients, dollars, meals, and blessings it brings back to the human and ecological communities of the upper basin. It even transcends the boundaries of the watershed. A wise woman once told me, you know, I really do believe that if we can bring the salmon back, we can save the world. And I think she's right. Restoring salmon is important because it would be a shining example of what it looks like to engage in reciprocity with this earth, our home. And that's just a brief excerpt from one of the many essays uh, in this uh, in this beautiful uh, collaborative project. And this is a time where you might want to pull out your cell phone or perhaps the um, folks at the Bowman Museum will, will make this PowerPoint available. Here are some links to some information. We don't have enough time to get into a lot of details tonight, but the first link is to the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission in Portland. They have a lot of information about the treaty. And there was a recent, um, forum, a webinar put on by the Lake Roosevelt Forum. It's all about the Upper Columbia salmon uh, recovery uh, process. And there's a YouTube um, uh, conference that you can watch. Fascinating, very informative about what's going on right now. And the last two, there's uh, the State Department, which is uh, the, the United States uh, leading an entity in the treaty. Um, and then the other one below that is information from the Canadian uh, uh, perspective. On, on things, the Columbia River Treaty, how it's affecting things in British Columbia. And, and this is just my information here. If anyone wants to contact me later on with any questions, um, and I, I appreciate the fact that uh, the folks at the Bowman Museum will share my contact information with everybody uh, as well. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. Again, I, I apologize for the technological uh, stuff. Um, and I, I just want to give a brief introduction to um, to Graham, I mentioned that, that we met on, on the river, but um, you know, in, in his book, in, in the book, there's the brief summary that says, Graham says he is an educator, a researcher, a writer, an adventurer who has traveled the entire length of the Columbia, including once like a salmon on bicycle from sea to source. So I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, Graham and let Graham make, make some comments and uh, then we can open up to uh, questions if that's okay. Okay. Thanks so much, Peter. I maybe I'll, I'll just uh, speak relatively briefly. Um, so all, all of you listening are, are in, I assume, in, in Crook County. In, in, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you would call it Eastern or Central Oregon. And, and I'm here in, in Golden, British Columbia. And um, so pretty well, we're on two different sides of the basin. Um, you know, Peter's, Peter's traveled the, the basin far and wide, as you can see by his photos. Um, I've, I've also done a lot of traveling, as Peter mentioned. Um, I, I followed the Columbia, the main stem of it, from the ocean to the headwaters. And I visited various other corners, including down um, in, in eastern Oregon. And what I think, for me, the Columbia River Basin is, is the most interesting place in the world because it's just so diverse. And the, the way that the landscape is where you live is so different than where I live, but they're part of the same system. And, and the water that flows in the creeks that you know, um, or you know, in cities, storm drains and past farm fields, it's, it's going to the exact same place as, as the water where I am. And it's a, it's a really exciting time to be in the Columbia River Basin. Uh, Peter was mentioning um, some of the history around what's happened and some of the potential for what is being worked on. And there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, policy and issues and things like the Columbia River Treaty, which is 
kind of one piece of, of the system in terms of how the watershed is managed. And it's especially a really important piece for the relationship between Canada and the United States as two countries sharing one watershed um, and, and salmon reintroduction to the upper Columbia beyond, uh, beyond Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, when I'm done speaking here, I'll put a couple of links in the chat. Uh, this past month, um, just a handful of days ago, there were two really amazing sets of events um, online, and, and there are recordings you can watch. Um, one that was a, a festival, a series of short um, virtual sessions all around um, Canadian-based efforts to reintroduce salmon to the Upper Columbia. And then uh, just right after that, um, partners in the U.S. that are working on the very same thing um, hosted their own um, their own event about it. And so you can go and check out both of those. Um, I, I think something that's that's really amazing about this moment in the Columbia River Basin um, is that um, more and more uh, people are thinking about um, balancing things and, and doing right by everything and bringing everything together. And in the past, I think there was a tendency um, to go all or nothing to, to have the, just the dominance of, of one value or, or a couple values. We're going to go all the way to this end of the pendulum. And as a lot of um, tribal leaders articulate really well, talking about present issues with the Columbia River Basin, um, it, we're in a time where um, it, it's not either or, it's not all or nothing. Um, we can have power and agriculture and flood control and fish and cultural values. And, and we know how to bring these things together. We have the technological tools, we have the capabilities to work together. And, and to just, I think that that philosophy applies to lots of things across the basin, but just to talk about salmon reintroduction above Grand Coulee Dam, um, the efforts to bring the salmon back that are being led by the tribes uh, and First Nations in Canada, um, those proposals are to do something amazing to restore salmon back to part of the watershed where they've been absent for more than 80 years without changing any of the system operations. Um, you know, Grand Coulee Dam and all the others will continue to operate um, for the other purposes that they have to meet power needs, provide flood control, enable irrigated agriculture. And, and we have the science and the, um, and the tools and, and everything we need to bring the salmon back to the upper Columbia um, without actually impacting those other values. And, and that kind of holistic perspective of thinking about, you know, how can we um, do right by all these things that matter to lots of different people um, at, at once and, and find the middle ground, um, I think is part of why it's a really exciting time um, in the Columbia River Basin. And um, I am involved in a number of NGOs that work on these kinds of issues. And um, in addition to posting the links to the two uh, digital festivals, the Canada-based one and the US-based one, I'll, I'll share a link to um, one of the um, organizations that I'm involved with that gives some more information on um, the kinds of issues that, uh, that Peter's referenced. And I, I guess if I was just to have one more final thought is that with these kinds of policy issues, um, it can, they can feel so abstract and so distant. Um, and I think Peter does an exceptional job of, of bringing these things into the fabric of, of life, of, of like, you know, traveling the river, seeing the people, seeing the, um, the different things that are going on, like, like that's what really matters behind all of the, the policy discussions. And so um, for me, I, I have a lot of interest in, in reading about what's going on, but uh, more than that, um, I think it's really important to to go and, and travel around that it is. Um, so th thanks for the, the chance to share some thoughts and be happy to answer, um, answer any questions. And thanks to the hosts and to Peter for the invitation. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very, thank you very much, Graham and Peter. Uh, feel free, I see we have, thank you very much for posting the, 
the links in there, Graham. Appreciate that. Uh, attendees, folks, feel free to go ahead and post your questions. And while you're thinking about your questions, I have a question both for Graham and then and also one for Peter. So Graham, I'll start with you. Uh, my, what I'm curious about is Peter was showing that absolutely awesome wetlands up there. Is there, is there a need or has there been any restoration work that needs to be done to those wetlands or are they in, in really good shape? Because I know here in, in Central Oregon, we have had some really incredible efforts to, to upgrade and improve wetlands. And that has just helped the steelhead tremendously. Well, yeah, so I actually live right on the wetlands in, in the town of Golden. And, and last two weeks ago, I spent four or five days um, canoeing through the wetlands. And, um, and they are in pretty good shape. It's, as Peter says, I, I'm not sure of the exact fact, but they're, uh, if not the largest, one of the largest intact wetlands in North America. Um, of course, there are impacts um, that affect the, you know, the ecological health of the wetlands, but in general, they're in pretty good shape. Um, one thing I was told recently is that um, uh, unlike a lot of places in the world, only a small amount of these wetlands have been filled in. Um, and, and partly when people came and in the early days of, of settlement and, and Europeans arriving in this valley, people thought like they did in other places, oh great, we'll fill in the wetlands and, and then we can farm and, and all this stuff. And there's just too much water here. It's too wet. And, and so it was just a, uh, a losing prospect to try to fill in the wetland and, and farm there because um, this is like the water tower of the basin. Um, I think only 15% of the land area in the Columbia River Basin is in Canada, but more than a third of the total water comes from here. So it, it's this is disproportionately where the Columbia's water comes from. There's um, big mountains with really deep winter snowpacks and glaciers and, and so that, that's a, a particularity of, of this part of the watershed. Um, and so thankfully the wetlands are, are, in, are in really good shape. Oh, wow. That, that's actually, that's wonderful news. That's yeah. really and Carrie, news. if I could just jump in here real quick, and, and because there's, we're still living on time, I, me I meant to say that from the headwaters for about 200 miles, it is wild and free. That's the, the one section of the river where it does run wild and free. And Graham, I'm not sure if it's a UNESCO designated protected site, but I know that the wetlands area is already under a degree of protection, uh, carry and participants. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it is as it has been since the beginning of time with, with some minor, you know, impacts of just people living nearby there. But it is, it is an astoundingly uh, beautiful place and protected. Oh, wow. Well, Peter, that, that yeah. actually leads me into my, my, other, my question for you. <clears throat> is I'm a geologist and my ears always perk up when I hear about groundwater influence. And you mentioned that the Kootenai is yes. a groundwater source. And I don't know if, I know you're a photographer, but yes. I don't know if you have branched out to understand, or maybe Graham has that underlying geology that is bringing that water across from the Kootenai drainage into that upper headwaters right. of the Columbia. Well, for people who might have the um, desire to someday get in your car and do like I did, drive all the way up to the headwaters, there, there is um, a, a wonderfully educational kiosk mm -hmm. at the short little five minute walk that takes you to the head, uh, headwaters that describes the source of, uh, of the water. And it's one of these, and Graham can jump in here and correct me if I'm wrong, but in layman's terms, the Kootenai River comes within about a third of a mile of where the Columbia River begins. And from talking to people up there, the best I understand it is that there's a, the water from the Kootenai, if there's a, it filters through, through the ground and bubbles back up near the marshy area where I, where I was standing. I mean, I have other images that shows the water just going bloop, bloop, just bubbling up out of the ground. The, but that is the actual beginning where it flows out and forms Lake Columbia. And Lake Columbia is, I think, about eight or nine miles long. And then from there, it drains out and starts, and starts the water. But I'm I'm pretty sure I'm right on that, um, but you know, Graham can weigh in on that as well. Yeah, that, that's about right. And, and I've just shared a, a link from 
to um, to a, an essay explaining that by um, someone that that uh, Peter, you and I both both know, Eileen Perps. Oh yeah. All right. Go ahead and capture that. Okay. Um, I want to jump in here with a question for Peter. I guess you would mention this early in your lecture, and you'll have to forgive my ignorance a bit on this, but you would mention the fish ladder. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but I assume it's a device that enables the fish to go over the dam and go on through. With something that simple, um, I mean, obviously it was costly, but but that would have been the answer that would have alleviated so much of this problem, just that? I think the most simple answer I can give to it may be more complicated, but in the simplest terms, yes. And now it would have been a great undertaking because a dam that size, I mean, if you've seen some of the dams on the lower Columbia River, like the Bonneville Dam and the John Day Dam, these are much smaller um, structures and the, the angle of approach is maybe like five or 10% grade. The Grand Coulee Dam, it, it, it could have been done, but they would have had to have started, um, and I'm not a, a, an engineer, but I would imagine a little bit further back and a bit of a, a little bit longer. But, yeah, but basically it's just a stairway with water running down and the, and the fish can sense where it is and they, and they would follow that up, 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 up and over. And so there are plenty of dams where the, where the fish are able to go. It's just that when the Grand Coulee was built, they, they chose not to include that. So now, you know, they're looking at all kinds of options from like what I showed you that the, the whoosh innovation, the salmon cannon to a very uh, simple kind of a, what I call like a blue collar approach, what they call trap and haul, where they would get the fish, put them in uh, secure containers and then drive them by truck from below Grand Co the Chief Joseph Dam up above Grand Coulee and put them in the water so they could go back up to Canada. But then you have the problem of the fish coming back down and how are they going to uh, survive going through the dams and the blades and, and all that. So there's something called a, a floating surface collector, which uh, tricks the fish to come into this, this floating surface collector. And then, then you do sort of a reverse trap and haul, you get the fish from that container, put them in a truck, and then drive them down, down river. So those, those are things that are being worked out right now. I know it's, it's been successful in some other um, Rivers uh, in, in Oregon, but these are all part of the things that are in the works. And as there's, is, as Graham was saying earlier, it's, it's just a very complicated um, process because you have economies of counties, you have politics involved, you know, and you know, it's it's just it's not something that's going to happen overnight. I mean, it took you know, uh, it's been over 80 years since the loss of the salmon. So if it takes anywhere from five, 10, 20 years to return them. Um, if we can see that in our lifetime, it's, it, it's all there. The, the technology is there. You, you need the will, a political will, and you need um, an involved and educated citizenry to, you know, get involved and talk to their congressmen and mayors and just say, look, you know, it's as uh, Dr. Michelle, the executive director of uh, Upper Columbia United Tribes says, this is for the benefit of all. It's not just the benefit of the tribes, but we would all benefit on many levels if the salmon were to return and have the river be flowing like a river should be instead of a, a river of commerce. Are these kinds of things I'd like to think, I hope so, requirements now for new projects like this necessarily or not necessarily? I mean, do these objections and issues have to be brought to the fore once it comes at the beginning, at the outset of a construction project? Uh, it sounds like there's more of a willingness to listen to these things, but I'm just curious about that. Um, I'm not aware of any new uh, construction of, of, of dams, uh, if, that, if that's what you're saying, if they would have to be, um, uh, if it would be a requirement to include fish passage. But I, I think that the, the larger question right now is, as Graham had uh, mentioned earlier, is that um, there is a way to do this without touching anything in the system right now. So that, that, that's the more important thing is to be able to get uh, the powers that be, the negotiators who are at the table and the politicians to come on board and right, say, okay, right. let, let, let's do the right thing. I mean, wouldn't that be great? Just imagine that. Let's just do the right thing. You start from what's morally right and then backpedal about the money. I mean, you know. It's... Well, I'm getting from Graham that the um, environment or the attitude now is better in that respect than it was yes. all those years ago. I mean, people come into it, obviously, with considering all sorts of options, viewpoints, and potential issues and try to come to an agreement. 
rather right. than just slam something through based on money or some other reason. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yep. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any questions coming up from the group. I'm going to give them a little bit longer because, Peter, I have a photography question for you. Okay. I'll do my uh, best. I'm, I'm newly retired the last four years. And one of the things that I have found is that catching that right moment hmm. that uh, when, you're, when you have your camera can be a real challenge. So for you, <laughs> what, has, what has been your challenge with photography for finding that, capturing that sense of place, that, that, that image? Is it something you start with in your head or are you looking for a set of conditions? Wow, that's, <laughs> that's my, about a 60 minute answer. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, there are so many things that, that go into the moment. Taking the actual clicking of the shutter is probably the easiest part of it. It's everything that leads up to it. So it's a combination of ridiculous amounts of planning and what I call research and development, like going to a location, finding the composition that you want, then studying the light. It's like, okay, what time of year will, will the light pass shadowed? When will it be warm? What's the best time of day? And there's so much that, that just goes into it, but so many uh, times, uh, Carrie, it's, just, it's very serendipitous. I mean, the first thing is if you don't just get on the road and go do stuff, it's, it's not gonna happen. So this whole project was a leap of faith a labor of love. It was really actually closer to, to, to 14 years that when I began working on it, the, the shot that I showed you of the river draining from the um, Lake Columbia, that was taken on my 50th birthday 15 years ago. And that's what, that's what jump-started this, the, this whole thing. But, um, you know, it all depends on what, what you're shooting. When it's landscape, it's all about the light. And there's no such thing as bad light. There's just light that's good for certain things and light that's good for, for other things. But this project, it was a little less about fine art photography. It was more about coming up with the images that were going to complement the story. And that's a little bit different approach. You know, looking at the essays as they came in and saying, okay, what, what do I need to do to plug this gap? How can I help illustrate a particular essay, a particular point? And so the combination of environmental portraits and just, you know, it's a huge river. So I was only able to include you know, in the book maybe 90 some images out of the bazillion that I photographed. And um, so I hope that in part answers your question. It does. And it makes me really look forward to getting a copy of your book. So folks that are that are still attending, don't forget to reach out to, to Peter's website and let him know that you were here listening this evening. And uh, if you don't already have a copy of this book, because I think this is going to be a fun read. Well, Sandy, the at, through the Bowman Museum and the Crick County Historical Society and Friends of the Library, we are already thinking about next fall and hopefully, fingers crossed, we may be able to do this in person, we hope, but we, have, we appreciate everybody remaining flexible through this whole year as we've had both a, a few, had some nice presentations in May at the museum and also had two programs here this fall. So be thinking about keeping an ear open for October. And Peter and Graham, thank you so much for sharing your time with us this evening. This has been a real treat. I have learned a lot and it's been fun meeting you both. Same so, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for everything. That was a wonderful, a great learning experience and a great send off to our May at the Museum. Thank you both.